Nothing compares to Jesus. I wholeheartedly believe that. If you open up your Bibles to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9 is where we'll be picking up the awesome story of Jesus this morning. We'll be starting off in verse 42. And so as you find your place there, have you ever seen a baby lift their feet so that they don't have to touch the grass? I mean, you know, you put them down on concrete and they're all smiles, right? But you put them down on the grass and they side-eye you all the way down as they lift their feet up. I don't know if I was like that as a baby, but I have never really liked walking barefoot on grass. I mean, you know, your bulletin cover would be my worst nightmare, right? Flip-flops made of grass. You know, I could tolerate it now if it's a really nice, you know, lawn, but if not, I'm grabbing some shoes. In fact, I will go out of my way to avoid that dilemma altogether, right? Walk on some concrete, give me a path, do something. Our attitude towards sin should be the exact same way. We should keep an eye on it because it's dangerous, right? We should be wary to tolerate it. And we should definitely go out of our way to avoid it all together. And so while this illustration works great for me, maybe the lawn is not it for you. Maybe there's an illustration that works better for you, but the truth is the same, right? Whatever it is, Use it as a reminder to avoid sin and its consequences. This morning, we're going to hear how Jesus illustrates the reality of sin. If he went to the trouble to talk about it, then I think we should pay attention to it. How about you? So let's pray this morning. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for today. We thank you for bringing us here to this place. God, I pray that as we look at the truth of your word, that you will speak to us, God, that we will hear, that we will choose to respond because your words are life and they are true. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's look at what God's word has to say for us this morning, starting in verse 42. It says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble... It would be better for him if a heavy millstone was hung around the neck and he be cast into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having two hands. To go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die, where the fire is never quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having two feet than to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes and be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. So what's going on historically that we've been looking at when it comes to the truth of Jesus? Mark wants us to understand how we can be a follower of Jesus how to be a follower of Jesus. See, Jesus has shown both Jews and Gentiles at the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 that he is the only one who could satisfy us. He's the only one that can satisfy what is missing in life. And let's all be honest, there's stuff that we realize is missing. If not, we wouldn't try to pursue so many other types of activities. Jesus has shown both the Jew and the Gentile at the transfiguration, both on the mountain and down below, that he will help and provide everything that's needed in life. So while we might think of life as being unsatisfying and we realize there's something missing and we keep trying to fill it with things of the world, God is saying, I can provide everything you need. It will truly satisfy you. It will fill that gap and that hole in your heart that nothing else will. 
And so now Jesus is telling that those who are with him, that a follower, a true follower, is one who is willing to serve all. We talked about that last week. What does it mean to be a servant and that we are to serve all? But he's going to tell us today that we need to be willing to take sin seriously. So if we are a true follower of Jesus, it's not just about us doing things. I mean, that's important, but it's also about taking sin seriously and the consequence that it can have in life. So theologically, Mark wants us to see the truth about sin from Jesus. All right? Jesus is going to tell us the truth about it. Jesus is going to reveal the seriousness of sin. Jesus says that it's better to be drowned than to commit sin because it brings so much harm. Now, I know you're thinking, but wait a minute. Drowning sounds harmful, right? I mean, where are we going with this? I know and before you really start thinking that this sounds so wrongly harsh for Jesus... Know that the verb form in this particular verse, in this sentence, reveals this to be hypothetical in nature. It's a teaching illustration, okay? He is causing there to be extremes in this teaching illustration to show us the severity, the seriousness of sin. So what harm then is communicated through the word stumble. He said, if anyone should cause one of these to stumble, the word literally means to put a snare in the way. It depicts someone being enticed to sin, falling as prey into a trap. So that's what it means to stumble. It means to fall into a trap that has been laid And so what it lets us know is that sin doesn't just impact the individual who commits it, but others who are persuaded to participate in it. Just like abuse to a child can have an impact throughout their entire life, Jesus is saying, do not cause one of these to stumble. Your sin will impact you, but your sin can also impact someone as innocent as a child, something to be taken very seriously. So what about this drowning? What is he communicating here? Well, the use of the millstone depicts the magnitude, the severity of sin. Because when you think about it, the millstone was the very large, immovable rock, right? That would, you place your grain on it, and then they would lower a, another smaller rock that was being moved by an animal, and they would use that to grind and, and mill the grain. And so it's letting us know that sin, it's impossible to escape from, all right? It causes death. I mean, you think about the size of that rock, that stone. You think about that being connected to you, right? There is no way you are escaping that. But it also is letting us know that it's going to impact the entire community. And see, when we sin a lot of times, we might, we might think about how it impacts us, right? But we often do not think about how it impacts everybody else. Because in this illustration, this millstone, right, is being removed. So it's taking a lot of people to be able to move that, right? And so now that the community has lost the millstone, then somebody here is going to be out of business, right? Not only that, it's going to affect the farmer and everybody else who used that millstone for its purpose. Now, you're not going to just have to harvest your grain. You're going to have to figure out your own way to grind it and to turn it into the product that is going to be useful for other people. So with this illustration, Jesus is letting us know that sin is inescapable. We can't escape its penalty and that it impacts not just the person committing it, but everybody that could be even loosely attached to it. Well, that's pretty severe, is it not? He goes on and Jesus says the cause of sin must be cast away 
no matter the cost. And this is the part of Jesus' teaching where we kind of go, uh, because we might think, well, you know what? That sinner deserves the millstone, right? They did this awful thing. But now you're telling me that I got to be mindful of it and it's going to cost me something, something that I don't want to lose, right? So every effort must be made to remove sin, even if the cost leaves you crippled, lame, or blinded. Now, that might sound so drastic that you're inclined to dismiss it. Oh, we know he's just speaking in a hyperbole, right? He's just making a big teaching point. But don't you agree with this? that it would be best not to reach for wrong desires with your hand, that that's where you should start, not being upset that it might cost you this, but hey, let's don't go there to begin with. Or how about it would be best not to move forward towards and identify with what's wrong, right? So, I mean, you think about what you do with your feet. You move towards stuff. And when we move towards things, we're saying that we're kind of in agreement. We're identifying with it. Maybe it's best that we don't use our feet for wrong instead of getting upset that, well, we're being told it might cost us our foot. Or would it not be best not to agree with wrong at all? you know, with the things that have become a part of you. Think about this. The things that you see with your eyes, you never forget. I mean, your brain is this amazing creation of God. You never truly forget anything. What you do sometimes, though, is lose the ability to recall it quickly, right? Sometimes we might struggle with that, but I mean, it's all up there. And so when we see things what, however and whatever wrong that might be, whether that's the moving pictures on your monitor or your TV screen or things in society or the things that you're participating in, I just want you to know this. Scripture is letting us know we take that with us everywhere we go. It becomes a part of us. And while you might say, really? Yeah. How, what does it take for, uh, for a memory to come back to you? You hear a part of a song, and you hear that song, and you're back in a moment, right? You're there like it was happening for the first time. Why? Because it's here. It's a part of you, and it's never forgotten. And so we tell children, be careful what you hear, see, and do, right? But that applies to all of us as well. And so... Since we are tempted, let's be honest, to minimize the risk of our sinful activities, they often then become repetitive habits, right? Ah, this isn't good. It's okay if I see this or if I touch this or if I do this. I'm only going to do it once, right? Well, if we're not careful, it becomes repetitive. It becomes a way of life. And it's against this type of stumbling that Jesus wants strong action taken against. He wants us to remove it. So thankfully, in keeping in line with this illustration that he's using, Jesus is not demanding the excision of body members, right? He's not literally telling us to cut things off. He's not doing that. But what he's doing instead is he's demanding that we cease these sinful activities, okay? He's saying they are so serious that I'm not just encouraging it, I'm demanding, stop it. Don't use your hands for wrong. Don't use your feet for wrong. Don't put wrong things into your mind. Stay away from it. He's emphasizing it in this dramatic way because he knows the danger. And let's be honest, we really do too, don't we? We try to deny it, but we do. So before this happens, he's what he's telling us, what we need to do is completely cast sin off. And so this word to cast off, it's in the present, all right? And what it means to do is it means that right now, in the present, we need to throw with great purpose and force, with great effect, and get rid of what is sinful, all right? Throw it with force, 
and purpose. Not drop it at your feet, not toss it over the side, but treat it like the hand grenade that it is and throw it as far from you as possibly can because it will blow up and it will cause you problems. And so that's what he's telling us to do. Cast it away. Radical means must be taken to remove the cause of sin and to prevent it, the resulting bad that does come from it. And so with this idea then, Jesus shifts a little bit and he shares the reality of hell. And I know you're thinking, man, I showed up on the one Sunday where we're talking about sin and hell. Touchdown, right? But hey, it's real. If we're going to believe that there is a God in heaven who loves us, then we have to also believe that there is a hell and there is a Satan, a fallen one, a deceiver who seeks to take as many of God's creation with him to the place of punishment that was designed for him. Now realize that hell was designed for the demons that fell, the ones that had rebelled. But when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, well, that brought us into the same penalty that they faced, right? And so Jesus ties the description of hell to a literal place so we will know its reality and make clear that it is a place that's entered by choice. Now, how do I know he does this? So the word for hell that's here in the original language in your Bible is the word Gehenna. All right. And that is an actual name for a valley that is southwest of Jerusalem. And so the word for hell in Greek is the name of a literal place, a place people can visit, a place people can see. And I want you to know it is an awful place. How do I know it's an awful place? Well, it was the place where the Canaanites sacrificed their children, their babies to the pagan god Molech. All right, Not just the Canaanites, but the people of Israel who knew better and were warned, they too sacrificed their children to the pagan god Molech in the Valley of Gehenna. That's an awful place. That's an awful legacy. It's the place where the dry bones of the dead were left and their burned bodies were discarded. So it was a place in the Old Testament where people were basically buried or cast off. So it is a place of death. Not just that, it also became the place where the trash, sewage, and refuge of Jerusalem was consumed by feasting worms and burned by a continual fire to destroy the impurities. So we get that this place is a valley of awful deeds, of death, and of, well, things rotting and burning in a, play, in a way that it never stops. Jesus is using a literal place that everybody knew about to describe the eternity of what life apart from God is like in a real place called hell. Now, that's not exciting to talk about, and I'm not trying to cast fear. I'm just letting you know it's the reality, all right? Jesus' use of the phrase where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched is to tie this literal description of this place to the final judgment. The last words that the prophet Isaiah wrote at the end of his letter in chapter 66, describes the eternal judgment of those who reject the living God. The verses prior talk about the hope that they have in the Messiah and talk about how God has prepared a place. But this last verse talks about, Isaiah writes about a place where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. And he's talking about the eternal punishment of those who reject God. And so Jesus draws on this language, talks about this literal place, and he connects it with the eternal punishment of those who reject God. Now, he wants them to understand that the seriousness of this sin is what leads to this particular place. So, 
there are two phrases in this, in this work where Jesus is talking that describe entry into hell. The first in verse 43 says, go into hell, okay? But you'll notice in verse 45, it's talking about being cast into hell. Now, we might just kind of skim past that and think, okay, that's no big difference, right? But as we know, words have meaning. Words are important, and they're there for a reason. And so what is it that Jesus is telling us here? Well, the first statement lets us know that hell is a place of choice. Go into hell. It means to follow after, all right? What that means is that we would rather send ourselves to hell than receive salvation that Jesus is offering. So I need you to understand, on one side of this, God does not send you to hell. Who sends you to hell? You do. I do, right? I'm responsible for me. If I reject God, it's nobody else's fault. I send myself to hell. So it's not how can a loving God send people to hell. Loving God doesn't do that. A loving God has provided a way to escape that. I, as the sinner, choose to send myself, right? I follow my way there. But he also said, cast into hell. Okay, well, it's kind of hard to kind of cast yourself, so what's going on? Well, that lets us know that the second statement, it's a place of result, all right? So yes, we send ourselves, but yet we are cast there as a form of judgment. See, if God is who he is, if we reject his love, then he must rightly judge if he is righteous and he loves us, right? Because there would be nothing worse than being, having somebody who was guilty not have to face the punishment, right? That's not right. That's not just is. That's not right. And so because God is just, he's right, and he only does right things, then he must then punish wrong, right? And so there is this idea of judgment. It's two sides of the same coin. On one side, we send ourselves. On the other side, it's the result of something we've done that we deserve, right? And so somebody is enforcing that. Both of these are 100% true. It just depends on which side of the coin you're looking at, right? Heads up, tails up, they're both true. And so the reality of hell is that it's bad, that we send ourselves, but God is just. It depends on the perspective there. So we've talked about the severity of sin. We've talked about the reality of hell. Mark wants us then to respond rightly, right? If you today have heard this, these people then, if they heard this, then Jesus is definitely saying, hey, Make the right choice. Do the right thing. He's not trying to scare. He's just laying out the facts. Wouldn't you rather have the truth and the facts than kind of walking through life, just pretending like everything's going to be okay until one day you find out, boom, it's not? And so that's what he's done. You need to learn from your past mistakes, Jesus says in the last few sentences of today's passage that everyone will face fiery difficulties. Man, I wish that wasn't the case. I wish we could sidestep all of that, wouldn't you? I mean, right now, some of you might be going through some extremely fiery difficulties. Man, I wish we didn't have to do that. I really do. But with these fiery difficulties, they will be like salt, all right, and so salt does one of two things. Salt either brings seasoning to life, right? Or salt can make things barren, right? We can salt the earth so that nothing grows there. So as we go through life, you and I, we face these fiery difficulties that come. And so God gives us the opportunity to learn from them or not learn from them. 
wouldn't you rather learn so that you don't have to go through the same lesson again than to not learn and just keep repeating the cycle of awfulness? And so the first takeaway is that we learn from our mistakes because if we learn from our mistakes, we don't repeat them. And this passage tells us that you and I, we get to be at peace with other people. Ah, I like that. Because the word peace doesn't just mean serene and calm. It means that we are made complete. That God gives us what we need to be complete as we walk through that fiery situation so that we can be made better by it instead of rejecting it and being barren and going through it in the difficulties. You follow me? So if there's something that's going on in your life right now that's sinful, man, learn from it, cast it away, and move on. Why keep playing? Learn the lesson that God is trying to help you with. Here's the second and the last thing for us this morning. You need to receive Jesus and be saved. All right, let me just say, that's what you need. Choosing to receive Jesus is the choice to reject hell, okay? You know, if you don't want to go to hell, the choice is Jesus. If you choose Jesus, guess what? You don't go to hell. The Bible tells us that we are dead in our trespasses and sin, but we can be made alive in Jesus. Now, here's the coolest part, I think, of everything that Jesus was saying today. So as he's talking about the reality of hell and he's talking about this particular valley, this is also what he's talking about. Some 600 years before Jesus shared this truth about the valley of Gehenna, there was a prophet by the name of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was told by God to go to this valley and to prophesy over the dead bones that were in this valley. And so as Ezekiel did what he was told and he prophesied over those bones, the Bible describes that those bones became alive, that they grew back together, that flesh grew back on them, that they became people and they were alive. All of this takes place in Ezekiel 37. I want you to know when Jesus is describing the hell of this place called Gehenna and talking about this valley, he's saying this, that Jesus can make you alive just like those dry, dead bones. Because without God in your life, you are dead in sin. You are dead bones and you just don't realize it. But Jesus is saying, I can speak over you and I can make you alive and I can make you a new creation. So if you don't know Jesus today, don't take the takeaway of this as, oh, I don't like sin and man, this sounds harsh and this is awful. The takeaway is you can escape it, you can know him and you can be alive in a way that you've never experienced. That's what he's offering you today. He's offering you abundant life. Here, and he's offering you the promise of heaven in the hereafter. And man, heaven is way better than the reality of the Valley of Gehenna. Hands down. I want to ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes this morning. We're going to have just a moment of invitation. I want to invite you that if you need Jesus Christ this morning, if you need to be saved from your sin, man, that's not shame. That's you coming to the truth and the realization that God has offered you a better way. If you would like to be saved, as soon as I'm finished praying, step forward, come out, talk to me, and we can talk about you believing in Christ and having a new life today. But I also want you to know that, man, don't leave this place without learning from your past mistakes. The things you're going through in life right now can make you bitter or they can make you better. Allow God to work in your life today. If you need some prayer, if you want, need some help, come talk to me. You can do that during this time of invitation as well, or you can catch me after church. But I want you to know that God wants to help you with what you're going through that he loves you like the little child that you are, and he wants what's best.
Dear Jesus, we do thank you for the day. Thank you for bringing us to this place today. Thank you for loving us enough to tell us about this truth, as hard as it is to hear. But God, please let us respond rightly and let you change our life for the better. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand to your feet.